While other cycling disciplines have a pretty narrow range of common tire qualities, the start lines of Brevets have a little bit of everything. Rock-hard, narrow boomer tires, invincible touring meets, artisanally rebranded Panaracer balloons, and even the modern race tire. Everything in between as well, even Bromptons and Mini Velos, the occasional mountain bike. Recent developments have reduced that diversity though, and to borrow a phrase from gaming, our sport is reaching a new settled meta for tire choice. In today's video, I'd like to discuss how tire construction, width, and pressure are all converging into an optimum ultra-distance setup, but also the missing data that we need to be certain in our tire selection choices. Welcome to Overbiked Randonneuring, where we min-max our equipment and strategies for success and enjoyment of ultra-distance cycling. Rolling resistance eats up a big chunk of our effort at normal speeds, so that adds up over the long distance and many, many hours of a brevet. For the overbiked randonneur, more faster is more better. So it's no surprise that we want our tire choice to be as fast as possible while still having a reasonably durable construction. Fast construction and durability are in conflict with each other though, which has been the crux of the tire selection conundrum for randonneurs for many years. As we can see from bicycle rolling resistance results, the fastest tires are less than two millimeters thick, so they won't last long or have puncture protection. Among the paper-thin TT tires littering the top of the chart are some very fast tires with some thickness of rubber, a touch of puncture protection, and other good qualities. With tubeless setups reducing the likelihood of flats, all-around race tires are now a viable choice where they were once considered a risky proposition. Models that headline with 8 to 9 watt results are consistently reviewed well, and two of the three have triumphed in Paris-Roubaix for the last three years, hinting that they're at least a little bit tough. Slightly down the efficiency list, some 10 watt tires add some thickness to their rubber while staying competitively quick. While these drum tests won't match the real results we see on tarmac, they do represent a rank order of performance and show a degree of difference that should translate to our real world conditions. Classic tough tires like the Durano or the Gator Skin roughly double the amount of rolling resistance of these fast new all-around race tires. Uh, napkin math suggests that's about 30 minutes of extra effort for 100 kilometers, or almost two hours of lost sleep on multi-day brevets. The newest crop of all-around race tires benefit from trends to go wider, and most are available up to 32 millimeters wide, often even wider. These will meet the grip and comfort needs of most long-distance cyclists. Sticky rubber compounds and slightly more robust construction on newer all-season models offer tons of wet grip when you see more days of rain each year than of sun. This is our new meta for tire construction, and it looks pretty good. The best tire construction only offers the possibility of peak performance. Choosing the correct width and the correct pressure realize it. For us ultra-distance cyclists, we have the compounding factor that optimal performance and optimal comfort might be in conflict with each other too. Here are a few things we can use to guide us in the right direction. According to drum tests, more air pressure equals more faster. And we know less comfortable and less grippy too. Testing done by the legendary Tom Anhalt and confirmed by Silka shows tires get faster with more pressure until they don't. And pressure beyond this most efficient uh, break point greatly increases rolling resistance. The exact mechanism at work here is debated, but we can generalize that impedance from road roughness overwhelms tires that are too hard. In their test, when the tire was inflated only 10 PSI above this break point, up to 18% more resistance was measured, while only one watt was added with a 10 PSI buffer under the break point pressure. To achieve a pressure with a buffer below break points for real world conditions and real world loads, an old school narrow tire risks pinch flats, cracked rims, and squirmy handling. Having cracked a few rims over the years, I can confirm that high pressures carry that risk too. Uh, the 25mm tire that they tested at 60 PSI would not be long for this world if I was the rider. Uh, for people like me and in conditions like I ride, more volume is needed just to allow safe access to those pressures that should be most efficient. So why not use that 60 PSI in an equivalent 42mm tire and dominate the rough roads? Well, aside from weight and aero penalties, the mushy and dangerous 60 PSI in a narrow tire would feel rock hard in a 42 millimeter tire. In theory, it would roll pretty poorly on rough roads too. 
At equal pressure, the larger tire will have more hoop stress, a term that represents the total outward force experienced by a tire when it's inflated. Hoop stress grows proportionately with size. The 42 tire has nearly double the surface area on its carcass of a 23 mil tire. If each square inch of that carcass is experiencing 60 pounds of pressure, the 42 mil tire will have nearly double the hoop stress if it has the same construction. Hoop stress explains why wide tires have lower max pressures, since a given pressure results in more hoop stress trying to rip the tire carcass apart and blow it off the rim. Matching hoop stress of a 25 mil tire at 60 psi, the 42 mil tire would instead have a cushy 37 psi, which would dominate the roughest tarmac, perhaps at the expense of smooth tarmac efficiency. Poor communication of the idea of hoop stress may have helped popularize the idea that wide tires roll faster in some groups, while at the same time setting back the adoption of wider tires in other groups. When tested at the same PSI, wider tires of the same construction achieve better test results in highly controlled conditions because they're more taut. In practice, a person moving from, let's say, a 23C tire up to a 28C tire like this one is going to be expecting better performance on rough terrain and better comfort. If they don't adjust their pressure, or if they only lower their typical pressures a little bit after they increase their tire size, they'll actually be sacrificing comfort, and it'll roll worse on rough terrain. If they experience that, they'll think all this wide tire talk is just hot air, and they'll move back to their narrow tire. If that happens, I wouldn't blame them. Folks are still divided on this issue, and I think a lot of it comes down to messaging. Wider tires need lower pressures just to equal the comfort and performance of a narrow tire. They need lower pressure still to see any benefit for comfort or on rougher terrain. The hunt for the perfect tire width and pressure continues, but we now have some assumptions to go on. Tire pressure calculators consider several variables to estimate ideal pressure for a given width, load, speed, and road roughness. Even with many variables, calculator results from SRAM and Goodyear match hoop stress equivalent pressures nearly perfectly across widths. User inputs for these calculators seem to merely target a desired hoop stress, which then gets translated to different tire widths. Other calculators deviate from pure hoop stress equivalents though, but they still seem to weigh it heavily in their equations. The slope of results across width from Silka and the Rene Hurst calculators are steeper than that of hoop stress. This suggests they account for factors pushing narrow tires to carry more hoop stress and wider tires to have less. While not a calculator, testing by bicycle rolling resistance shows tires of different widths when inflated to equal tire drop perform with the same efficiency on a drum. Their results nearly match hoop stress too and are titled as being at the same comfort level. Despite minor differences, expert recommendations correlating so closely to hoop stress suggest hoop stress plays a significant role in determining comfort and performance of a tire, no matter its width. That's a lot to take in. So to try to summarize it, here are the implications that I've gathered. Tire construction is a primary driver of efficiency. Material quality and thickness impact this a lot. Target tire pressure should be slightly below the breakpoint pressure for the roughest roads that you want to efficiently traverse, but also high enough to be quick when it's smooth. Tire width should be chosen so that its breakpoint buffer pressure has a low risk of pinch flats, rim damage, and poor handling. Comfort and efficiency of tires of the same construction at the same hoop stress are nearly equal across widths. Points 1 to 3 are supported by plenty of reliable evidence and have been used successfully at all levels of road cycling. These are a great starting point to set up our tires. However, the certainty in our choice hinges a lot on point 4 being true. If it is true, we have so much flexibility to achieve optimum efficiency and comfort from a wide range of tire widths. For us ultra-distance cyclists, this can also impact and inform our decision to maybe sacrifice some of that efficiency for more comfort to make it more sustainable, or perhaps to add some efficiency with compliance features like the Redshift shock stop stem that I reviewed up here. Hmm, what's this? So point for point four though is not as strong as I would like it to be, at least outside of a laboratory or outside of some theories. It needs some real world validation. Does hoop stress equalize comfort across tire widths? If not, to what degree, or in which circumstances? 
Does hoop stress equalize efficiency across tire widths? Are comfort and rolling resistance directly linked? If so, is there a set level of vibration to indicate whatever that breakpoint roughness is? There's so many questions to answer, and I hope to do just that. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out.